friends and comrades, uh, welcome very much to uh, to Mayday Bookstore and Cafe. Uh, this is uh, this is part of a regular series of events that we are hoping to have at the bookstore, where uh, we can we can discuss um, issues of contemporary importance and relevance. Uh, today's discussion is essentially centered around the whole question of the crisis the economic crisis, the ongoing economic crisis, and, and the politics of the left. Now, this, uh, for this discussion, we are very uh, glad to have with us uh, two eminent Marxist intellectuals, Professor Ejaz Ahmed and Professor Prabhat Patnaik. Uh, I'm not going to you know, introduce them uh, to a gathering such as this. We are all very familiar with them, with their works. We've heard them, we've read them and so on. I should just say that I am um, particularly pleased that in the first uh, of these discussions that is happening, the two of them are here because both of them are also members of the editorial advisory board of Leftward Books. So therefore, it's a very special pleasure um, for me to have them here um, for the discussion today. We've all been following the news and we know that very recently the elections in, uh, in France and then immediately after that in Greece uh, have sent out a strong message. Uh, and, and very clearly, the economic crisis that, uh, that sort of came uh, to head in 2007-2008 in uh, has still shown no signs of, of going away, uh, of abating. Now, every moment of, of crisis is also necessarily a moment of opportunity. Um, and, and the moment of opportunity is obviously a moment of opportunity for revolutionary advance. But of course, there's no one-to-one -one direct relationship between the two. In other words, if the revolutionary forces, if, if the communist left forces, the working class, um, and so on, are actually in a position to take advantage of that, um, of that crisis situation, then of course the crisis can turn into a uh, into a revolutionary crisis, uh, into a revolutionary opportunity. Uh, on the other hand, if that is not the case, in fact, the very opposite can also happen. And there are numerous instances uh, in world history to show how an economic crisis has, has in fact led to the emergence of very rabid right-wing, uh, in fact, even fascistic uh, forces and so on. Now, uh, it is now four years since, since the crisis began. And of course, the end doesn't seem to be anywhere uh, on the horizon. Let me ask uh, uh, Professor Patnai that it's also becoming increasingly clear that, that the people, uh, especially in Europe and in North America, are reacting very strongly to the austerity measures uh, that have been put in place by, by the parties of neoliberalism. Uh, the, quick, the key question in, in some ways is that is this, in a sense, the end of neoliberalism? Uh, or is it merely a temporary blip out of which neoliberalism will regroup, will emerge stronger, and so on? Do the recent, uh, uh, do the recent election results, but not just the election results, I'm saying, do the recent waves of, of, of protests, strikes, and so on um, across Europe uh, mean that the moment of neoliberalism has been significantly challenged. Yes, you know, when it comes to neoliberalism, it does not have alternative agendas. It has one agenda. The real hurdle to our overcoming neoliberalism is our having our own agenda. And I think the real problem in Europe is actually having an agenda which would successfully take you beyond neoliberalism. In other words, if you're going to confront finance, which is the main force behind neo neoliberalism, you have to do so with an agenda, and it's not very clear in Europe. Even though there's electoral victory, popular struggles, and so on, how these popular aspirations are going to be transformed into an alternative agenda. Let me just state very simply that, you know, that, that, that let's say prior to neoliberalism, you had all over Europe and the advanced capitalist world, significant state intervention in demand management. That was Keynesian demand management. That was done within the context of a nation state, 
and you had capital control so that the nation in a sense uh, was sufficiently cordoned off for the nation state's writ to run within the nation. With financial flows becoming liberalized, which happened in Europe in the 60s, happened elsewhere, subsequently in India in the 90s, it becomes very difficult for the writ of the nation state to run, which is why Keynesian demand management is out. Now, if you are thinking in terms of a demand stimulus as opposed to austerity, then either you have to, as it were, recover the nation state, like getting out of the eurozone, having capital controls, putting barriers and so, that, so on, so that, let's say, the nation state that is formed on the basis of the verdict of the Greek electorate is able to have an economic agenda other than that of finance. The alternative, which is the alternative that I suppose anybody on the left in Europe would like, is that actually you have the pan-European nation-state itself really, in a sense, taking on a role which is different from that of being a spokesman of finance. I think that is what the socialist agenda is, to what extent they succeed in doing and so on, is a different matter. But I think a lot of the movements in Europe, of the left, would combine to put pressure on transforming the pan-European nation-state itself into something beyond what Angela Merkel uh, wants it to be, and that means basically overcoming the close links between the state and finance. You know, in, 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 in other words, the state is no longer in thraldom to finance, but the state, the pan-European nation-state has an economic agenda which is in the interest of the people. And this, of course, is going to be bitterly opposed by finance. So I think, in a sense, the, 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 the denouement of the people versus finance is in fact now coming into itself. And how would you, um, how would you sort of see this central contradiction in a sense between between the people and finance playing out in the coming uh, few months and and years? It is. taking up taking up from there. Uh, some of the things that uh, Prabhat was saying. Um, it's not only the left that has gained somewhat in a couple of countries. The real story in Europe is the rise of the far right. Um, the, in, in 2010, in the Netherlands, the far right got 24% of the vote and became the deciding fa factor in Netherlands politics. Um, in, uh, in Austria, far right is absolutely normal now, having ruled, it's absolutely normal. Um, in the French elections, uh, uh, Marine Le, Le Pen got more votes, I mean, percentage of the vote, not only of, the, of uh, <coughs> Mélenchon, but also says uh, increase. Okay, that's that's the big news. Um, now the other side of it is that what what Prabhat was saying that either you reclaim the nation state. That has become a very big agenda with the with with these. For convenience sake, let's say far right. Uh, the far right is a very interesting phenomenon, uh, and especially Marine Le Pen, uh, who may in fact emerge from four or five years from now as the major force in France. Uh, she the, was the only candidate in France which had a progressive foreign policy, which was absolutely against every imperialist onslaught, who stood for the creation of Palestinian state complete withdrawal from Afghanistan, Iraq, and so on, denouncing French activities in Libya and all that. A full-fledged left foreign policy coming from the far right, as, as it were. Um, and Le Pen is the one who is speaking the language of, of economic nationalism. So now what is happening is that the 
finance capital has waged and is still waging the most powerful offensive against the European peoples since the 1930s. It's the most ferocious form of class struggle. Um, Merkel has said that if Greece leaves the euro, we, we can adjust that. The eurozone, we can adjust that. Um, we will not give them the next trench of uh, this, that, and the other. So, so, so the, 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 the finance capital is actually digging in. Holland, the uh, social democratic um, uh, uh, president now, the new one in, in France, who went to uh, meet Merkel, uh, just as uh, the Syriza uh, was being asked to form the government in Greece, um, I, th I think he has indicated very much to Merkel that he's, he'll be on the side of Merkel if there is a confrontation between Bowen and Athens. Um, I don't expect anything else from them. Uh, which takes me back to the fact that the neoliberalism was not implemented by the right. It was implemented, it was a joint policy of the social democrats and the right. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a European ruling class as a whole. Um, okay. My sense is that the European peoples in a variety of countries, in Spain, France, Greece, of course, uh, in Italy, in a number of countries, are very much opposed to the austerity program, but they don't have a political mooring as such. In Spain, which has had, next to Greece, Spain has had the most radical um, uh, popular uprisings uh, next to Greece. Uh, but when it came election time, um, they elected a, uh, the candidate of the, uh, of very much of the right, who said that he was going to uh, impose these austerity programs. So there is, there is, a, I, th I think the left alternative in, uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous vacuum. Now, because there is a crisis of this kind, political crisis and direct confrontation of that kind, I think certain factors in the political scene can change very rapidly, as we saw in Greece. Um, things can change in some countries, things can change quite rapidly towards the right, towards the left. Which way it will go is very unclear to me. Um, uh, so uh, uh, so that, that's what I would say, that there's a spontaneous sort of feeling of very vast majority of uh, Europeans in most countries against the austerity. But there's complete political confusion as to which side you go. Uh, and that also is true of the working class. Working class vote of Le Pen is not minor. PCF has no, the, the French Communist Party has no base among the working classes. It's now a party of the, the professional middle class. So there's also that kind of transformation going on in the political field in a moment of crisis. So just, just I just want to add two things. I, I, you see, I think the fact that the right is now the carrier of economic nationalism or claiming the nation state is, I think, a result in Europe of the default on the part of the left. In other words, Italy is a very good example. You know, I mean, I think in Italy, the austerity measures are being imposed through this government, you know, which is a sort of technocratic government and so on. But the opposition to this government, which is the loudest, is coming from Berlusconi. If there is an election, Berlusconi would get elected and not the left. And the second point I want to add to what Ajaz is saying is that I think on the part of the European left, there's a complete intellectual paralysis on the question of the nation state. I mean, you know, because I can understand because wars and so on. I mean, they see nationalism as a dirty word and pan-nationalism as a way forward, even if it's pan-nationalism 
of the kind that they are having. And, but on the other hand, that is something. So either you convert the pan-nation itself into a progressive force for popular uh, intervention, or alternatively, you have to opt out of it, and none of them would visualize opting out of it. And that's why, you know, I mean, in a situation where, where sort of Blairite social democracy is completely as a just is in cahoots with the interests of finance, the left, which should actually be leading, if you like, the intellectual charge on it, is really quite paralyzed. And what is your sense of the future of, uh, of social democracy itself? I mean, uh, for at least two decades, if not more, um, as you said, uh, social democracy has, uh, has not just embraced neoliberalism, it has in fact, um, I mean, neoliberalism has been the policy of social democracy. But um, on the other hand, right now we are at a fairly interesting moment where, for instance, in, um, in the recent elections in Germany, um, uh, in the regional elections that happened, the SDP uh, um, has, done, has done fairly well. They were part Absolutely. Um, and uh, in France as well. Now, Greece, of course, is a very special case and we'll come to that in a moment. But uh, do you think that this is a, uh, that this is a moment where these traditional social democratic parties of Europe might sort of regain or reclaim some of their older uh, uh, sort of social democratic moorings, uh, if you will, rather than uh, only tactically sort of try and adjust at the moment, but not really. Uh, all right, uh, there are two, two or three things uh, here and then, uh, but very curious to hear uh, Prabhat tell us about it. Um, Melishon was a member of the uh, Socialist Party for 30 years. He was a minister in Jospin's government. Uh, he's a social democrat. Um, he's trying to reclaim social democracy for a radical past of social democracy, what social democracy once was. Um, and around that, build a coalition and so on. The same is true of Oscar Lafontaine in Germany. What is happening is that the radical sections of the social democratic parties are leaving social democratic parties. Either formally leaving them, as these uh, very prominent uh, leaders have done, or not voting for them. I mean, much of the vote for that has gone to the left is actually historically social democratic vote. And what one is hoping, by the way, in Greece is that now that it is quite credible that Syriza will form a government, a lot of the um, uh, PASOK, the social democratic vote, what little is still left of it, will come to him. You know. So, I mean, what's happening to social democracy actually is, and that is because social democratic parties were so profoundly committed to this banker's Europe, as I call it, uh, that they themselves have absolutely no where to go when they approach elections, they start talking in mild sort of Keynesianism. And when they are in power, there is a logic to what they have historically done. So what one hopes is that, that there would be a split in social democracy and the radical sec sections of it will come out of it and join the left. Yes, I mean, I think this you find already happening, as you said, in the German Social Democratic Party. In the British Labour Party, the younger Miliband becoming the leader is in some sense reflective of the strengthening of the left tendency within it. Now, I think all over Europe, the trade unions have been quite militant, even though social democracy has not been. This is true of France, this is true of Britain, this is true even of Spain and so on. You know, in some sense, the trade union movement has really taken on finance on the question of austerity, while there is no political formation correspondingly of the working class to actually provide that kind of political lead. Now, I am hoping that in the new situation, 
where actually the anti-austerity mood is getting politically reflected, there would be a split in social democracy. But you know, the split alone is not enough. It's very important for the left to have a clear agenda. You know, because I'm not even sure when Ed Miliband, if he comes to power, what exactly he's going to do. I mean, just as we're not sure what the socialist president is going to do, is he going to stand up to Merkel or is he going to actually cave in to Merkel? So, so it's very important for, for the left in the broad sense to actually have a clear agenda. And, and I don't think at the moment they still have. And personally, I have actually encountered this even in people like Zizek and so on. Their attitude to the nation is an extremely hostile one. And in that context, I mean, you know, suppose Greece does not get accommodation from the pan-European formation, what does Greece do? It may have to uh, come out of the Eurozone, it may have to have a debt moratorium, even if it doesn't wish to come out of the European community, it will probably be thrown out of the European community. And many intellectuals on the left would see that as possibly a reactionary development in Greece because strengthening of nationalism is supposed to be, and I suppose I have some sympathy for this, is supposed to mean in a certain sense strengthening of, of, of right-wing forces, inward-looking forces and so on. Uh, yeah, but just let, let me just add one thing about this uh, thing about the European left's attitude towards, um, to, towards nation, nationalism and so on. Um, I think one of the ways, one of the consequences of it is that they, in a much too facile fashion, use the word fascist for some of these right-wing forces. Marine Le Pen is in no classical sense a fascist. She's a right-wing radical. Uh, precisely because they are nationalist, that they, they, they try to occupy the space of economic nationalism, they are seen immediately as, as xenophobic. Um, that and, and, and fascistic. Nationalism for them is really always a right-wing ideology with a fascistic content. And that is where the, this Zizek business that you're referring to always play, or also plays. Let's talk a little bit about Greece. Now, um, how do we see the rise of the series? Um, would you say that it's a genuinely radical left force? Or would you go along with the assessment of the KKE, which sees it as a revisionist, sort of a breakaway, uh, you know, trying to disrupt the unity of the, of the left and so on? And uh, on the other hand, how do you see the stand of the KK itself, which says that we will have no truck with anybody until uh, this question of, uh, of, of coming out of the Eurozone uh, is, is, is settled? How do you see this? Uh... You know, I, I, okay, let me put it this way. You can call it a failure on my part, my weakness. But I really believe that finance is an extraordinarily powerful enemy. Given the extreme power of finance, and its power arises because it's not visible. You see, a landlord is visible, but finance is not. You know, I mean, there are all kinds of ways in which it actually, uh, uh, you know, kind of defeats you. So given that, I am a person who I believe that the widest possible united front against finance is required. That does not mean you, you united front at the expense of giving up the anti-finance agenda. But to the extent you can accommodate an anti-finance agenda, you really need the widest possible united front tactics. Now, I have always been struck by the fact that the KKE does not believe in this. And that's my feeling. I met some of them personally a um, couple of years ago, and I thought they, were, they, they really were not seeing the need for united front sufficiently. That's my feeling. It may be a prejudice, but that's the way I see them.